Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Bonnie Brzozowski and I'm a public services librarian at the Corvallis Benton County Public Library. I would like to welcome you to this library sponsored event, a screening of the short documentary, Silver Spot, The Flight to Recovery. It's about the threatened pollinator, the Oregon silver spot butterfly and recovery efforts to save this species. Before we get started, I would like to just take a moment to point out that there should be a bubble with a question mark um, to the right of your window where you're viewing this event. If you click on it, you can submit questions and comments or just if you need to tell us something anytime during the presentation and during the documentary. So we welcome your questions throughout. As soon as we're, so we're going to start with an introduction to the documentary from Julia, Julia Johannes, field ranger at the Sayuslaw National Forest. Then after watching the approximately 16 minute documentary, we will be joined for a question and answer segment by a panel of the researchers and scientists that have been a part of the Silver Spot recovery work. A note that a recording of the question and answer segment in the documentary will be sent to all who register for this event. So if you can't stick with us the whole time or you, or you know someone who wasn't able to make it, um, hopefully they registered and we will send a recording or just send us an email and we'll send you a recording afterwards. I would like to mention that Julia Johannes was instrumental in organizing this event and the library is really appreciative that she reached out with the opportunity to share this documentary with our audience. So Julia, would you like to join me on screen? Sure. Thank you so much, Bonnie. And thank you all for giving us your time this afternoon on this beautiful, it's beautiful where I am, uh, Saturday afternoon. Um, as Bonnie mentioned, my name is Julia Johannes and I'm an interpretive field ranger with the Sayusla National Forest out on the central Oregon coast. And last season, I was given the really awesome opportunity to get a front row seat to some really exciting research and monitoring efforts that were happening on our forest for this threatened species, the Oregon silver spot butterfly. This opportunity came about um, by a friend of mine, Samantha Derenbacher. She's the lead biologist for the species with the US Fish and Wildlife Service out of the Newport office. And she approached me in the middle of the season asking me to make a short film about some of the research and monitoring efforts that were happening on our forest for the sole intention of updating the internal community of scientists who were working for this towards this recovery effort since many of them weren't able to make it out to the field because of covid but as i was working on this film and out in the fields following following around these amazing scientists i quickly realized this was way too big of a story not to share with the world and uh, also too big of a story to tell in three to five minutes. So turned into this wonderful project that I've just been so inspired by um, getting to work on this and getting to work with this amazing group of scientists. So I'm really excited to share this film with you today. Also, we have, as Bonnie mentioned, an incredible panel of some of the amazing scientists who are making this work happen. So please uh, take advantage of this opportunity um, to ask them as many questions as you like about this really exciting work. It's, it's a pretty neat opportunity. So um, without further ado, Bonnie, I'll turn it back over to you and I hope you guys enjoy Silver Spot, A Flight to Recovery. Thanks, Julia. Great. So you'll only see me for about a second more. I'm gonna go ahead and share this documentary with all of you. I hope you enjoy and then we'll be back on as soon as it's over. The Saisla National Forest has been working with the Oregon Silver Spot Butterfly for about 40 years. It was listed in 1980. And um, back then, pretty much all we knew about it was that it was dependent on the early blue violet for its host plant. The caterpillars can only eat early blue violets. And that early blue violets were being overtaken by invasive grasses. They were being topped over, shaded out, dying off. So our entire program consisted of trying to cut back those uh, non-native grasses and improve habitat for the viola dunca or the early blue violet. 
Unfortunately, despite all kinds of efforts, for years and years and years, the overall population trend kept decreasing until the point where of the five populations that were around when it was listed in 1980, we only had one population left on Mount Hebo that was able to sustain itself without help from us. That was a pretty scary moment for us when we realized that. And one of the big things that we realized was that everything we knew about the silver spot was based on when it's an adult. And we could only study the adults for a few weeks every summer. And their needs when they're an adult are way different than their needs from when they're a caterpillar. And so to me, I felt like the only way to try to turn around this downward trend was to understand what was impacting the butterfly during 80% of its life when it's a caterpillar. The problem was that nobody had ever found a caterpillar in the wild and we didn't know anything about what they needed in the wild. Fortunately for me, I was working with a group of detection dogs on another very rare species. And when I was out in the field working with them, I just started talking with them. They're brilliant biologists in addition to being dog handlers. And we sort of just talked through the problems. Could we find caterpillars in the wild using detection dogs? And their answer was, as long as we have training material, we can find them. Once we were finally able to train them on live caterpillars from the zoo program, we were able to cover such a large area and the dogs would indicate and they were able to very quickly in just a few days tell us that yes, there are caterpillars emerging from diapause, they are surviving and they're well distributed across the landscape, which again, at that point, we had no idea any of those, any of those answers. And figuring out that there were a lot of answers to be had if we could study animals in the wild, um, I started reaching out to research scientists like Cheryl Schultz at the Washington State University, Michelle Zorches with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and Rich Van Buskirk from um, Pacific University. As a kind of group, we would go back to all of the questions that we had had um, over the years, and we tried to get it down to if we're going to affect survival of silver spot, what do we need answers to? So we picked a few questions. There has been a lot of work out at these sites, at the Forest Service sites, the state park sites, and others, where there's been a lot of management on the ground for the last 20 or 30 years or more, at the same time as they have been bringing uh, butterflies out from the zoos, so doing captive rearing program. Very limited monitoring had been done, and so we knew that there was management happening, and we knew there was captive rearing going on, but we didn't know what the effectiveness is. We didn't know, like, is it working? Cheryl, I think that's your 160 over there. So we reached out to Dr. Erica Henry. Erica is an amazing butterfly ecologist. She's really one of the leading butterfly ecologists working with rare butterflies. She has incredible experience, diligence, creativity, and talent, and was the perfect person to really lead this study in the field. What we did is we went in and clipped the grasses carefully and removed all the thatch around the violets in an area that we could monitor. So we put in enclosures that are a meter and a half by a meter and a half. So that's about five feet by five feet. I like to think of them as baby play gyms because when I first saw the picture, it made me think of all the baby play gyms. So it's our silver spot baby play gyms. In a couple different places, we had uh, plots that were clipped pots that were not clipped, and then we also put in uh, loggers to measure temperature and humidity, and put the caterpillars in, put the enclosures over them, and then waited to see how many butterflies would come out. And those are just about done coming out. When we started, there was all these questions like, would any butterflies come out? Would they crawl under? Would predators like bite through the webbing? Would would bears get them because bears have now gotten some into some of the pupil enclosures all kinds of things like we just didn't know we have seen lots and lots of butterflies come out of them erica has been pulling them out daily and she has started to pull some cursory analyses it looks like around twice as many butterflies are coming out of the areas that are clipped versus areas that aren't and we think that makes a lot of sense because we know from studies that were done on larval biology that when caterpillars are crawling around the ground, they'll finish eating a violet and then they've got to find their next violet plant. 
And if it's bare ground, they can crawl around and they kind of wander for a while, but they find more violets. But if there's a ton of that, just kind of like going through a maze, they're up and down and up and down and around and over and they can crawl a long time, but it's much harder to crawl through, you know, 10 inches of thick thatch than it is to crawl over bare ground and find what you're looking for. Because even if you don't find it immediately, you go, oh, I just bit the wrong thing. I'm going to go find something else. You know, that's really informal. We haven't formally analyzed the data, but the gestalt is we're getting higher survivorship in the plots that have been clipped, which is, you know, that's good. <laughs> it's good information because it helps us think about what's the effect of potential management, how do we manage habitat in the future. That also couples with other pieces of interest, which is these butterflies have been put in the field for years from this captive rearing program, but because they've never been marked, we don't know what they're doing. We don't know whether they survive. We don't know where they go. We don't know if they completely disperse off site and never come back again. We just don't know what the effect of putting all these individuals is in terms of does it actually help our wild populations. So this summer's project is really two pieces. One piece is funded by the Forest Service which is to look at the effectiveness of habitat management on the ability of caterpillars to grow and survive in these habitats. And the second part funded by uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is to look at the adult dispersal and look at where do the captive individuals go, meaning not captive, but raised in the zoo and then released, versus where, what are the wild ones doing? How much are they flying around between all these different pieces of habitats? A very common way in butterfly ecology to estimate population size is through mark recapture methods. And basically the idea is every day you go out and you mark every butterfly you see that's unmarked and you identify the mark, so in this case the silver or the uh, blue glitter on the wings, to know that it's been marked. So by knowing the relative proportion of marked versus unmarked each day throughout the season, you can statistically estimate both how many butterflies are out within the entire population over the season. You can also find out how long individuals are living, so adult survival. At first I was playing around with how I wanted to mark them. Um, so this one actually has silver gel pen on the underside of the wing too but I wasn't certain if that would last long enough. And so that's why we switched to the Sharpie because I've done mark recapture with Sharpies before and knew that that would last. And then when you let them go, you just open your fingers and they flap around and they pretend like you killed them. And then they fly away just fine. <laughs> Every time we see a butterfly, we take a GPS point and record the behavior. That one was just basking in the grass. Whether it's a new capture or recapture, if we catch females right now, we're noting whether they're like freshly emerged or old and tattered. Whether we use the net to reside a butterfly and if they're nectaring, what species of flower they're nectaring on. And then we take a picture of the vegetation around where we saw the butterfly so we can do some vegetation analyses later. In order to do any sort of work with the species itself, you do have to get permitted through the Fish and Wildlife Service. So there's a pretty large process where you submit your project plan and the Fish and Wildlife Service determines whether or not your project aligns with the recovery of the species. And we'll start to answer some of those really important questions to lead towards recovery of the species. And if it does, then the second step is Fish and Wildlife Service determining the potential impact by doing this study that you're going to have on the species. And that's both in a negative and a positive light. So that's when I came into the picture and that's when uh, my office and Michelle Zwartchess with the Newport Field Office came in. The wonderful thing is the type of research that was being asked to be done. That can answer so many questions about the life history of a butterfly and they're not really questions that we have thoroughly explored in the past and every single answer will make giant steps towards recovery of the species. The other piece that we want to understand is their dispersal behavior. So we want to know, you know, is a butterfly that gets that comes out here 
found somewhere else. How much is it traveling on a daily basis? And these guys live a long time on a weekly basis. And we're finding out a lot. We're seeing marked individuals that are moving between parts of this meadow system within a day. 192. We just marked this butterfly. And sometimes finding them weeks later, which is super exciting. Oh my gosh, it's number 16 again. It's the oldest female we marked. Most of my work has been with blue butterflies that live a week to 10 days maybe. So the fact that we're seeing individuals that were marked on like July 5th and now it's August 19th is really um, pretty impressive. This species is doing things that I just, I'm, I don't see a lot of species doing personally and I think that's just so neat. There's even stuff about adults that we thought we knew just about everything about that we're discovering for the first time. And by having people out in the field and taking such a hard look at this stuff, other things started popping into you know our awareness. I mean, the biggest surprise was that butterflies came out. The first butterfly was seen on June 25th, which was really early. And we marked probably 130 wild butterflies-ish um, in the next three weeks or so. And only maybe a handful of them were females. But then we just like did not see them. We did not recite any of them. Every butterfly we caught and marked was a male. And we were like, what is happening? <laughs> you can't have a population with no females. And then really just like a week and a half ago, maybe. So like August 5th or so, we started catching females. And we started reciting females that we had marked, you know, like number 16 and 17 were the first two females that I marked on July 5th. No sign of females. And then those first few days with females, we recited both of those butterflies. So females have merged here early and they must have, they either left the site or they, I mean, I, I feel like they had to have left the site. So now I have new questions about like, where do they go? If they're going to some interior meadows, like there have to be flowers to keep them alive for a month. If they're gonna live for a month and then come back here and lay eggs. But then there's also fresh individuals emerging. Um, it's like multiple reproductive strategies. You know, if there are females going somewhere to interior meadows, then knowing where those are is really important for population persistence because we have to have resources in the landscape to keep the females alive before they lay eggs. Um, the other thing is that if Butterflies are emerging earlier because it's getting warmer, but they're still laying eggs at the same time that like stretches out the amount of time that they have to stay alive. Um, and if both of those things aren't shifting in the same way in a warmer year, then that is really interesting and could have some sort of unique climate change impacts for population persistence too. So now all my text messages to share were like, I have new questions. I have so many questions. When we started this summer, when everyone involved, all of these wonderful partners started the summer of, you know, investigating these, these two big questions, everyone had in their minds that this is called a pilot year. So it's a year where you're doing something really different from what you've done in the past and you have no clue if it's going to be successful or not. And we clearly have seen a ton of success um, in both step one and step two of this multi-year, multi-level project. And I think that's a perfect segue into just continuing to expand because the pilot year ended up actually being a true sample year for us, which means we have great data for one of these locations that you know a meta population is at. So the hopes and the dreams are to expand that project in future years to all of our other locations where the silver spot is currently found or can be found or has been found in the past to start to make that bigger picture of what's going on in each of these habitats. Is it different? Is it the same? Does it allow for maybe large weather events? If climate change is directly impacting certain locations, are there other locations that we can work on that you know we can develop into a habitat for them to use in the future and all sorts of great questions like that. 
This is a great example of different agencies working together um, and really coming together as partnerships saying we need to understand more about the biology and its habitat in order to really design effective conservation. It's been a pretty exciting summer and um, we're really looking forward to gathering up everything that we've observed, everything that we've learned and discussing some next steps and what answers we need a little bit more depth on and where we can go from here and what changes we might make to, to management on the Sayusla that uh, we can then see if that's going to help turn this around for the silver spot. Great, that was wonderful. I would like to invite um, our researchers and scientists that are here and Julia to come back on screen with me and we can do some question and answer. And if you'd like to start submitting um, any questions that you have or just comments you want to share, please do so as we wait for everybody to join us. Hi, everybody. Don't forget to unmute yourself. There we go. Hi, yeah. everybody. Great. <laughs> Hi. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, I'd love to kick off this uh, panel discussion. If you guys could introduce yourselves um, and just say who you are, what organization you're coming to us from, and how you're involved in this work. Um, Deanna, let's start with you. Hi, I'm Deanna Williams. I'm the lead biologist for the Sayusla National Forest. Um, I would say I came to this work um, when I came to the forest. It was a big program that we had for habitat management. Um, and, you know, like we've been talking about, it, there was a lot of questions and we didn't seem to be getting where we wanted to go um, and so I started asking questions and started thinking about if we could come at it from a different point of view and lucky for me there was an amazing group of people out there who could do just that. Awesome thanks Deanna. Let's go to Jennifer and Heat. Uh, hi my name is Jennifer Hartman and I'm Heath Smith. And uh, we're with Rogue Detection Team. So we um, work with the detection dogs that are doing the, the larval um, sniffing work. Um, and Heath, um, you should, you've been on the project longer than me. <laughs> uh, yeah, we have rescue dogs that help find the, the frass, which is, is the scat of the caterpillars. And, and now we're detecting caterpillars. Thanks, Heath. Uh, Rich, tell us about yourself. Sure, Rich Van Buskirk. I'm a professor of environmental science at Pacific University in Forest Grove outside of Portland. And uh, uh, I think I have the longest history here with the butterfly because <laughs> I actually did work on this species for my PhD thesis and uh, worked on it for a fair bit when I came out to Pacific, but then moved on to other things. And uh, it was the opportunity to work with Deanna and with Heath and Jennifer and the whole potential to try to crack the mysteries of the, the larval ecology of the species that drew me back in. And it's been really exciting to learn so much in these past few years with this team. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's it's so exciting to have all of these amazing people in one virtual room who've just done such incredible work. Um, I'd love to, to start with Jennifer and Heath, if you guys could talk a little bit about um, rogue detection teams and how how you guys train your your dogs to find frass and scat, um, and then how you kind of train them to to find the caterpillar frass. Was that different from working with other types of species with something so tiny? And what were some of the challenges you faced doing that? Yeah, thanks. 
Um, yeah, our dogs are, they're kind of, as we're called, rogues. They're, they're a little bit of the rogues or misfits of the, of the canine world in that they have this insane, insatiable desire to play fetch. Um, and, and a lot of times when they're not getting a play fetch, that leads to them getting in trouble. And folks get a little get a little frustrated with them, and then they find themselves in a shelter, and nobody wants to adopt them. Um, but we do. And so we we scour the the world for them and adopt them. And then uh, they help us by finding different types of odors. Uh, it may be something like the caterpillar with its frass or the actual caterpillar. Uh, it might be carcasses. Um, it could be rare or invasive plants, pellets, um, all sorts of things that we do. For this work, uh, when, I think it was like eight years ago or so now, but um, the, it kind of came out of the blue. And um, we got a little bit of frass in the mail and I set it out for Allie to detect and to teach her the odor and everything. And as soon as she smelled it, it looks like, it looks like poppy seeds or pepper flakes kind of. Um, she went to smell it and it immediately disappeared. Um, not from her inhaling it, but because she kind of breathed out to breathe in and it just blew it everywhere. And um, so I had to figure out some different ways to teach the dogs the odor. And the first thing we did, because we, we, were, we were leaving the next day actually to go to Mount Hebo to look for this, um, I took a piece, a piece of scotch tape and, and poured some of this frass on it. And then I just hid the scotch tape around and, and she learned to find it pretty quickly. Then we hopped in the car, drove to the coast, and um, went to see how it would work out. And I, I, I remember meeting Deanna, and the first spot we went to, it was um, we weren't sure it was working. We were like, yeah, she's not really alerting to anything, and, and maybe this won't work. And, um, but shortly after that, we switched to a new site, and Allie just started uh, pinpointing places all over the place. Um, and it was fantastic. It was, it was really incredible to see her start to find these things. And obviously we couldn't see the frass, but we could see where the caterpillars had, had been eating the leaves of the violets. Um, and then we marked some sites for Deanna to, to take a look at as the, cat, as the butterfly started to emerge. And sure enough, the, the spots that Allie had a lot of hits had a lot of butterflies and where she hadn't, there weren't a lot of butterflies. Um, then we kept coming back uh, each year, working with Deanna and Rich. Um, and trying all sorts of different things. And then last year, we got to start working with larva. And, and at, at this point, Allie had retired and two of our, our somewhat younger dogs, Pips and Filson, started working and detecting, uh, we found 13, is that right? I think so. Thir 13 larva <laughs> last year, um, which folks hadn't found in over 40 years in the wild. So it was pretty, it was, it was very exciting. Will you guys be going back out to those the Rock Creek Meadows to look for larvae again this season, or will you be working on Mount Hebo, both areas? I think we'll be doing both areas, um, and we're we're looking forward to getting back out and seeing seeing how the dogs do now that they have a year under their belt of, of finding larvae. That's so cool. Ah, I just I love the the concept that these two species that you never would think of in the same space are working together and you know that one one dot species can help another in a very unlikely way it's it's pretty pretty wonderful to think about <laughs> yeah it, it's 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 extremely rewarding especially in helping with conservation efforts but also in helping these dogs find a purpose again and and giving you know giving them this opportunity yeah and um when researchers like Deanna and Rich um, kind of go out on a limb and, and try something different, which the, the detection dog methodology kind of is, um, it's really special because they stuck with it for years um, while we were kind of troubleshooting. And so I think this type of method really depends on people like um, Deanna and Rich to, to give it a chance in the first place um, and kind of be patient and, and get, you know, wait for those results because they'll come. It just it just depends on on the on time and and um, just figuring different things out together, and they've always been there every step of the way. So it's been really really awesome project. <laughs> and 
And maybe Deanna, you can share a little bit more about that first year working with Allie. I know that that was a, a pretty, uh, pretty neat summer and you guys learned some things that you didn't expect. Yeah, um, it was pretty, pretty exciting and it was 2015. So yeah, it's, it's been a while and um, uh, we, you know, like Keith had mentioned, we didn't have very much time to train Allie. We just had this little bit of caterpillar poop on a piece of scotch tape and, um, you know, when we first took her out, we, I thought <laughs> that I would take her to the meadow that had had the highest adult counts in the past, thinking that if there was a lot of adults flying around, we had a higher likelihood um, to have a lot of eggs and caterpillars, you know, later in the year. And so, you know, when he says we weren't finding anything, it was quite distressing to me because I'm like, oh my gosh, this is the area where we have the highest counts of adults you know, leading up to this year. So what is happening? And the other thing that happened when we changed sites um, was that not only did Ali start indicating, but she started indicating in areas that we had not normally thought of as uh, prime sort of microhabitats for silver spot. And these areas tended to be, you know, kind of near shrubs or kind of in the shady side or um, one particular spot was on the, and the windward side of a little knob that got all this cool ocean breeze. And we think one of the things that was going on is that summer was super, super hot. And up until I think last year, it was the hottest summer on record up on Mount Hebo. And um, where the, the caterpillars had survived in the past, they did not survive that year. And so actually what Allie was telling us was that, um, hey guys, what you've always done isn't necessarily going to work into the future. You have to provide a lot of these little microclimate habitats so that the caterpillars have a chance to, to survive these crazy weather swings. And so her sort of showing us that was a huge eye opener and, you know, really helped us um, dig in and, you know, kind of think, okay, there's more that we need to learn and there's more information out there that can help us with these. Um, with helping to recover the species. So yeah, it was, it was very hot and it was, had a lot of ups and downs, but, um, and we didn't actually even know how right we were until the adults flew a couple of months later. And definitely where Allie had given us a lot of indications, um, we had adults flying and where she said, no, there's really not that much going on. Even though they had been super popular in the previous years, there really wasn't adults flying. And I think that was the lowest um, the population on Mount Kibo had ever been. And so, um, yeah, it was it was really amazing that that even in such a low year, uh, she was able to teach us so much. I love that story. That's so neat. <laughs> Thanks, Deanna. But before I hop in with another question, I just want to check in with Bonnie if we had any from the chat. Yeah, we have had a few. Um, David says, so Allie trained from one day to the next? Wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> Diane, well, let's see, let's start with Brian's question. Brian asks, um, can planting blue violets help the butterfly? Um. Yeah, I think that um, if you are in the right area, uh, which is in their, their home range along the coast, it can definitely help. Um, the thing that you kind of have to keep in mind is that uh, you might have to consider your little blue violet patch as sort of a unique little native corner where you don't spray, you don't mow, um, and you have to be ready to see your plants get eaten, right? Because that's what the violets are there for. And um, so it can be a little bit distressing for, for gardeners um, that work so hard to get your plants to live and suddenly something's eating it, but something's supposed to eat it. Um, so definitely, yeah, if you're on the coast within the home range, it's um, individual homeowners can make a really big difference, both with early blue violets and with uh, nectar flowers for the adults, definitely. To piggyback onto that, are there 
certain nectar species that you guys have observed, they tend to favor more so than others? And what, what are types of nectaring species that uh, people could plant if they wanted to put more food out into the landscape, if they lived on the coast in, near that near habitat? Yeah, I'll start it off and Rich, if you have any ideas, you can you can jump in. Um, so I think that for us, the most popular plant that we see them uh, nectaring on is um, is goldenrod. And sorry, I had to think of the, the common name for a second there. Um, and but one thing to keep in mind so we have goldenrod we have asters we have pearly everlasting um uh, there's a native thistle that they really love when that when that comes to bloom so um those are the things we see them on the most often but what i'd like to encourage people to think about is one that uh we always prefer to try to plant native species uh, native plants for native uh, wildlife species and so there are different places, different nurseries um, that sell native plants that would be really beneficial. Um, and the second thing is that uh, we don't have to be married to those particular plants. Um, as you saw in the video, their season, uh, the caterpillar, or, I mean, excuse me, the adult season is getting longer. Um, and so providing a variety of plants all the way from June through September is really what we're going for. And so if you can go to your native nurseries and have at it, anything that's blooming from, you know, say mid-June to uh, mid-September, you know, a variety of plants um, would be wonderful for solar spots, um, for sure. Yeah, Deanna, those are some, some really good points relative to what homeowners can do. And it, it kind of speaks to the opportunities with insects in general. Right. What we're talking about doing is creating little tiny pockets of remnant prairie in people's backyards, which is completely possible to do. And whether it's for the Oregon silver spot, if you happen to be in that area, or whether it's for some of our native bees or other native insects, if you start thinking about opportunities to bring in native grasses, native forbs, nectar species, host species, stuff like that, the community around you, the insect community around you is going to respond to that. And it's going to be a really interesting place to watch, regardless of whether you have threatened species coming to those resources or just some of our natives that are really struggling to find good habitat. Yeah, excellent, excellent point. And I think uh, we can probably, the Xerce Society has some very awesome, we can try to provide a link, um, sort of tips for homeowners that would like to have like a native corner of your garden to, to help uh, those kinds of species that we can try to put in the, in the chatter um, later on. Yeah, I have a resource, a digital resource packet Great. that I'll be sending to Bonnie to send out when, you, when she sends out the recording of this to all the attendees so that you have those links at hand. That's great. We do have another question. Do y'all want to field that? Sound good? As a pollinator, what is the silver spot's main purpose in the ecosystem, i.e. propagation of the violets? So that's a that's an interesting question. Um, with, with the Oregon silver spot, uh, a butterfly species that nectars on a variety of, of, of of native species out there in those grasslands, its pollinator role is really going to be a little bit more closely tied to those goldenrod and aster and other things that it's bouncing around and visiting. Although it's dependent on the violet, it's really looking to the violet as a place to lay its eggs. And in fact, the flowers of violets are, are, are not that dependent upon insect pollinators. So it doesn't play a direct role really in propagating violets. But it probably, along with many of the other species that will nectar on things generally, will help to spread pollen amongst those nectar species in its environment. And I want to encourage folks to keep submitting questions. I actually don't have any other questions. I don't know, Julia, if you had some other talking points that maybe we could get into. Oh, yes. I have lots of questions. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, can you maybe Deanna and Rich, both of you guys, can can you talk a little bit about what you guys learned from the habitat management surveys in the tents um, and how that information, how you guys might use that information this season um, and moving forward? Yeah, I'll jump in with the Forest Service perspective and then, um, you know, let, let Rich take it from, from his perspective. So within the tents, you know, like they talk about in the film, you know, so uh, a lot of our management in the beginning with the Forest Service um, had to do with trying to keep the vegetation short so that the, the violets could um, you know, be seen by the butterflies um, and that they could get sunlight and, and all that kind of stuff. And one of the things that was happening um, that we kind of knew, but we didn't really understand how much it was uh, impacting the caterpillar is that a lot of these invasive grasses um, get really happy when you mow them. And they, when you stop them from going up, they go uh, sideways. And so what that was doing is that it was creating a really, really thick, what we call horizontal layer. So we were controlling the vertical layer, but we got this really, really thick horizontal layer. And for us, controlling that thatch um, was a, something that we had considered and were playing around with, but it wasn't something that we had put a lot of time and effort into up to this point. And so finding out how much removing that thatch layer impacts the, the survival of the caterpillars to an adult really, I think, kind of helped us say, yeah, okay, this is worth the time and the investment to try to deal with this thatch. And, you know, there's so many things to spend money on, and it's really important that, that we be able to, to put our time and attention into something that we know is going to make an impact. So that was a really big thing for us. Yeah, and I'll just follow from, from what Deanna was sharing there, and just maybe thinking a little bit big, pic bigger picture about what's going on with this. When you're working in grassland environments, they're really, really tough to maintain. They wanna change, they wanna become shrubland, they wanna become forest. And it's really disturbance, fire, grazing, any one of a number of things that keeps opening them up. And we know that these grasslands have changed quite a bit over time, both from lack of disturbance, trees and shrubs coming into them, as well as introduced grasses taking off and really displacing some of the native species. So to go back to the tent question, we don't have a good sense of what those caterpillars are doing in these grasslands and how they're being impacted by the change. They're really tough to follow. We can't mark individuals and see which ones survive and which ones die. So the enclosures are a really nice way of putting a number of caterpillars in there that we know at the start how many go in and getting a sense of how many are gonna survive to adults. And if we put some of those tents in areas where we've cleared a little bit of the thatch that can make it hard to move around, and some in areas where we really haven't done anything, we can start to see whether clearing that thatch makes a difference. And that's really what we're trying to do with these enclosures is to experimentally set up conditions where we can change the habitat a little bit to see if it makes things better. And if it makes things better, we should get more adults. We should have more of those caterpillars sur surviving to adulthood. So it's kind of, it's been really neat to have so many different researchers pull together on this project and be able to tackle different pieces of it to try to unlock some of those secrets that have kept the species at really low and declining levels for so many years. I'm hoping that we're gonna learn a little bit more about what it really needs. And then the, the land managers then should be able to adapt and respond to that knowledge and hopefully uh, help steer the grasslands in a direction that's gonna be more beneficial, not only for the silver spot, but for many of the other native species that call it home. Thank you for that. That was great. Um, I also would love if you guys could speak a little bit about um, the second half of the studies was the mark recapture work that was done. And there were a lot of really cool, crazy things that um, we discovered as this work went on. I think I was talking to Erica last week and she told me that the number 16, who was the oldest female, ended up flying for nine weeks, which <laughs> And a butterfly is insane, um, or at least to my knowledge, that seems very, very, very long. 
And I know that a big question that came from this work last season was the question of where the females are going for this large chunk of time. Can you talk about um, any plans for this season on how they might be investigating that question um, and kind of how 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 we might answer that question? Yeah, I'll I'll jump into that to start. Um, there's going to be more work happening with with mark for capture as well as other survey techniques that'll give us a sense for how many butterflies are out there. But in general, with this, as we as agencies like Fish and Wildlife Service, Saisla National Forest take risks in allowing us to study butterflies and to mark them and follow them and put a lot of effort into that, we learn a lot more about their behavior, their lifespan, as you were pointing out, and the, the areas that they require in order to survive, lay eggs, reproduce, and keep the species going. So with these techniques, both mark recapture and then uh, some of the surveys we're going to do, we'll have a better sense of the numbers of butterflies that are at each site. And then we'll also be able to figure out, we'll also be able to identify individuals that have traveled larger distances and hopefully find some of those meadows that Erica in the film was referring to where they're likely going over these long lifespans. So that, that spatial part of this, knowing how much landscape the butterflies need, knowing where they go at different times, knowing what they use while they're there, if we can get a better sense of what those requirements are, then we can start protecting those areas and making sure they're close enough that the butterflies can access them, use them, and then you know live life to their fullest, really, and, and do well within those areas. Thanks. Bonnie, just checking in if we have any other chat questions before I keep going. We did get another one. Um, did the research teams discover any other threatened species while doing their work? Do you guys know? Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, we're, we definitely have our eyes open. Um, but uh, this particular time, no. But uh, like Rich mentioned before, we've got a lot of um, sort of rare and declining bumblebees, and uh, that's you know become a, a real big concern for us. Uh, we have a couple of other butterflies that um, shares you know either the same habitat but have different host species um, or host plants. Um, and such as the coastal greenish blue butterfly and the seaside hoary elfin. Um, and so what, what we would like to do, the, the, the direction that I'm trying to take the, the Cytoslow's program is um, to sort of get away from this idea of managing for a single species. I mean, we do have to make sure that the components are there for a species such as the silver spot because it's in trouble. We need to make sure those components are there. But the idea that, that we're trying to incorporate is that if we manage the entire meadow community and we can support as many species as possible, um, there might be some community interactions between the butterfly and other, um, other species that occupy the grasslands that we don't know about yet. And, and through that community interaction, you know, that might help them thrive um, a little bit better. So, we did not discover any any new ones, but um, it's definitely something that we've got our eye out, and we would we would like to um, restore these habitats in a manner that can support multiple species. Yeah, I think unfortunately it's not really a question of having discovered or identified species we know that are rare or or in danger but getting a little bit of a sense of how much in decline many of the species that used to be there are. You put a team like this out there and a, a large number of folks who know meadows, who know butterflies, who know other insects. And we were, were constantly remarking how once common species are much less common these days. So I think in some ways we're learning a little bit about this broad decline of insects that's been noted globally is is playing out in these meadows that used to have a lot more of common species like ringlet butterflies that just aren't nearly as common now. So seeing a little bit of that decline in the work that we're doing. 
And then we got a few others if we, if we want to go with those. That sound good, Julia? Uh -oh. Have the rogue detection dogs worked with other butterfly populations? Good, good question. Um, we did some work with Taylor's checker spot um, on the Olympic Peninsula, working with um, Olympic National Forest. And that was really exciting um, because it, I think in some ways, at least for me, um, being newer to the project than Heath, it really gave me uh, a leg or a paw up to, to then switch gears to the um, Oregon Silver Spot because um, a lot of the work with being a handler is having confidence in, in, your, in, in trusting your dogs and confidence in the reward. And with the Oregon Silver Spot, like Heath and Deanna and Rich were sharing, you can't really you can't really tell, you can't really see until we got the permit last year to uh, actually search for larva. Oh, we were depending on the frass, which to the human eye and dirt and all the other little um, things going on. If you get really close, just try to imagine how complex the little microhabitat is and to try to find a pepper flake and that is insane. So that's why the, the feeding marks were really great to highlight to us like that Ali had was finding um, sites to go back to the Taylor's checker spot, what's really neat about them in their larva stage is that they have a webbing and a lot of that frass gets kind of trapped in that webbing and a lot of the caterpillars are kind of in this communal um, up a stalk, um, uh, they share it. And so when the dogs would alert to um, frass of the Taylor's checker spot, I had a clear image to be like, yes, awesome, cool. And so I could consistently reward Filson and get really excited about him finding this larva. And then when I switched gears to the um, Oregon silver spot, I then had more confidence, um, even though it was a different species, um, to kind of uh, help me, one, in my search method, but then also uh, trust him when he had alerts. So I think that was really, really exciting and important. And I think that it kind of leads to how, um, especially with the previous question about um, discovering other species that might that might be around, um, potentially the dogs could could assist with that too. Thank you. And then we do have one more um, from David. Is fire important on this landscape? If so, has fire history, frequency, and severity changed over time? Um, yeah, so as near as we can tell, um, the native human populations did burn our coastal meadows um, uh, fairly frequently, and uh, there were other disturbances that happened um, at a uh, larger scale, you know, big, big ocean storms, uh, that would come and and you know take chunks of land away and deposit new chunks. Um, so th there was a lot more disturbance, and fire was definitely a part of it. Uh, we don't have a really good sense of how often um, or all of the areas where they did apply fire. Uh, we can kind of assume that a lot of these meadows that we have left, uh, the settlers chose. Um, because they were already open. And so a lot of these areas had a history of having uh, settlers uh, make them into pastures for the livestock. And in general, uh, you know, those were chosen because they were already open. Um, and as far as, you know, using fire to maintain the meadows, it's definitely something that we would like to do. Again, um, we have these crafty little invasive grasses that also really love fire. And so when we apply fire, they get really happy and they um, outcompete and just smother all of, of the, the violets. And so it's a very complex uh, situation to reintroduce fire um, and have it, you know, recreate the structure of the landscape while not um, encouraging, you know, these invasive grasses that will uh, sort of smother out the rest of the community. Thank you. I know that they did some burning at Nestucco, which is another site for the silver spot. Maybe Rich, can you talk about um, what they did over there and kind of the plans for this season following that burn? 
Right. The Nestucca site is a really interesting one because it's a place that has a lot of open space, but that was more or less highly degraded grassland. There weren't, weren't a lot of native species in there. So they've been spending multiple years working to introduce some of the native grasses and some of the other species that were present there and using a whole combination of techniques that include fire to try to manage that system and push it closer and closer to what we think it once was in terms of a native community there. So that's one of the areas because um, there's uh, a lot of experience with implementing fire, with using herbicides, with using uh, mowing to try to guide the, the development of those areas. That's one place where we've set up some experimental treatments to track how that grassland community responds to fire and in turn track how the butterflies come into those areas that have been treated. So we're pretty excited to have this opportunity. Um, it's not just fire, but it's when you burn. It's how many times you burn. You know, there's a lot to the implementation of fire. And I think what many of us find really, really frustrating is that you're on a you're on a coastal setting where it's windy, it's wet. There's all kinds of things that make it really hard to use fire. So as as much work as you put into planning to have controlled burns, you're somewhat at the mercy of weather and resources available to carry that out to actually implement it. So we've kind of got our fingers crossed that we've got some experimental burns coming up here in the next few weeks uh, and another set a little bit later in the summer. And it's going to be really exciting to learn not only how the meadows respond, but whether the butterflies favor those areas where we've been able to use fire. I'll, I'll say to you really quick uh, to add on to that, that um, when they started the restoration of Nesteca, there were no butterflies there and there were no um, violets above ground. Um, and so they have a lot more freedom uh, to experiment with these things and to apply, like Rich was saying, multiple techniques um, without having to worry about how it's going to impact the, the remaining population. Um, so it's a great, uh, just a fantastic testing ground. Um, and we're so excited to have the research that Rich is talking about because it will, being able to do it there, um, we can work out some of the kinks before we apply it to sites that actually have the butterfly. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you guys so much. So I think we only have a couple minutes left. Um, Christy, if there aren't any other questions, I'd love uh, to go around and just have each of the panelists tell us one or a few things that we all could do um, to help the Silver Spot. How can the community at large help these efforts? If anyone wants to jump in. Um, if I may, oh, sorry, Tiana, if I may interject very quickly, um, the last couple of questions or comments we got, I think, are a really nice seg into this portion. Um, someone had just meant, and maybe this is something we can include in the um, packet that you're sending out afterwards, Julia. Someone did ask, as an aside, if you have a fetch-driven dog, are there any trainings um, for animals to get involved in detection type of work. And someone just mentioned they've been a volunteer, uh, volunteer with both bumblebee and monarch populations um, in Idaho. So there's other kinds of efforts happening elsewhere. And now I will turn it over to you again. Ah, you know, just everyone. following on Julia's request and those closing statements, Christy, I think the, those last couple request questions are really good because the ability to keep your eye out and to observe these species like the Oregon silver spot, our native bees, other native butterflies there that have been declined, and to share that knowledge and share that information with, with researchers is key. The more folks we have out there looking around and the more folks who learn enough about these species to be able to identify them, uh, that information collectively tells us a lot. So, so getting engaged with your, your local native insects and focusing on a couple groups that you find really interesting, using resources like at the Nature or at Xerces Society and other groups to learn how to identify them and where you might find them, and getting on iNaturalist or some of the other citizen science apps to share that information is a great, great start. Um, I'll just jump in and say that. Uh, you know, again, if you're if you're on the coast, um, 
you know, setting aside a little a little corner of your garden for, for native plants that are silver spot friendly would be fantastic. If you don't happen to live on the coast, um, you know, those those native corners of your garden are still super important to a lot of other uh, native birds, uh, native pollinators, native insects. Um, in fact, there's a couple of studies out from the East Coast that show even uh, what we consider kind of a common bird like the chickadee, um, if they have fewer than 80% native plants, in a neighborhood, then the chickadees' babies don't survive. The adult chickadees can survive on the food that's available, but there's not quite enough um, food available to, to have babies survive. So having some native components to our yards, even within a city um, or on the, the edges of the city is, it can just be so, so important. And also, you know, I just second Rich 100%, you know, get involved, get outside, do something that you love. Um, your support is the only way that we can make all of this stuff happen. And so having interested and engaged communities is what it's all about for, for us. And I guess we'll, we'll um, chime in and um, I would also share um, I think what's been really exciting about this project is is getting to work with a native pollinator and realizing that when you go out there seeing how much is connected um so it's like deanna was sharing before it's not just one species and you realize when you start to take a closer look that there's a lot more going on and a lot more that's being affected um, by some of these changes in the, in the environment and so it is really exciting when you step outside and take a, a bit of a closer look you start to realize like oh my gosh it's all connected so um, to answer the question about if, if folks can get involved, um, if they have a fetch obsessed dog, um, I just want to mention that um, uh, some other programs do this work too, and, and they actually have food treat, uh, food reward dogs. So um, while we work mainly with fetch obsessed, there are multiple um, types of uh, dogs that um, you could get really excited about um, finding an invasive plant in your backyard or in your community, finding a native plant that might be super rare um, and kind of helping those efforts. And you might, um, to get some experience in it, you try some um, nose work classes. We don't know a lot about nose work classes because our work is very different, but I, th I think it might be close enough to what a, um, a community um, outreach might might be like and in that sense um, then you could reach out to your local like nature conservancy chapter or Xerces chapter and see okay I have this this pup um, we know how to find odors and I want to help on a small scale um, how can I do that and a lot of that takes a lot of personal initiative so it takes a lot of behind the scenes um, getting to work with your dog learn how to communicate with your dog um, and then, and then approaching folks um, who might need this, this service. Um, but just to warn people, there isn't a lot of um, funding in this field. So a lot of the effort might be volunteer, but it can be a really rewarding volunteer experience. I think um, it's what drew me to the field of wildlife um, to begin with, was a lot of volunteer efforts I initially did. And, and realizing that volunteers um, can have a really positive, amazing effect. And I, I think it also creates a community in a way. You know, we're, we're talking about these pollinating communities and, and microhabitats, but when, when you start to get involved on a community level, realizing like, oh my gosh, there's a lot of other people who also care about a lot of the things I care about. And now in a way you're building your own, you're growing your own um, community. And so I think that's that's pretty inspiring too, to think about um, when you get out and outside and start, um, looking around and seeing what you can do. I, I would just add as, as dog owners or dog parents, um, being responsible for your dog and picking up after them, making sure they're not chasing wildlife and that they're um, kind of also well contained in, in areas where these efforts are going on to bring back native species and, and not disturbing those areas. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just jump in and say that here in Corvallis, um, I believe Wonder Dogs has a great nose work um, uh, class, and I don't know the name of it. Again, I'll try to find it and send it out, but um, I believe that Corvallis also has a triple finding 
um, class for people and their dogs. And um, so even if you uh, don't get directly involved in conservation, um, you know, I have, for instance, taught my dogs uh, my own scent because I'm always dropping gloves and various items on the trail. And uh, when I look down, I'm like, oh, crap, where did my glove go? I can tell them to quick go find it and they'll race down the trail and bring it back to me. And so there's all kinds of different things that you can do with a fetch obsessed uh, dog to, to use their nose. And, and it's just really great to see them uh, just light up with joy and energy um, when they're playing, when they're, it, it's a game to them um, and they really, really seem to enjoy it. Awesome. Well, I just want to say thank you all again so much for taking the time to join us today. Um, thank you to our amazing panelists. That was just a wonderful discussion. And thank you for lending your time and your expertise to share with us today. It was really an awesome, awesome opportunity to hear you guys speak. So thank you again. Yeah, I'll just echo that. We really, really appreciate it. You guys were amazing. I learned so much today. This was really fascinating. Thank you for your time. I know y'all are very busy. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, thank you for hosting it. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for bringing this knowledge to our community. We Again, we just so appreciate it. This was incredible. <laughs> and thank you to our panelists out there for sticking with us. And I hope everyone has a great afternoon. I think we're safe to sign off. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you Have for coming. Have a great day. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.